Welcome to Fred and Amy's Math Shack. Hi, and welcome to the binomial distribution continued. So previously, we've uh, looked at where this distribution has come from, the fact that we've got this factorial, this ncx, written also as this, written also as n factorial divided by x factorial, n minus x factorial. We talked about where that came from, and you're essentially finding all the different ways that your successes and your failures can be, can be permutated. We then understood that we're going along a tree diagram, so we have to multiply by the number, or well, the successes, the probability of successes, and the probability of failures. Okay, but there's something we've not yet looked at, and that's what we're going to do right now. We need to think about whether the model, the, uh, sorry, the binomial distribution is a suitable model. Can we actually use it in different situations? And here are the conditions for it. So number one, there needs to be a fixed number of trials. This is imperative in the binomial distribution. We've got this parameter, n, which says the number of trials. So you have to have that. So if you were uh, shooting 10 hoops in basketball and you're interested in whether you get it in the basket or not, you can model it with a binomial distribution. Well, this is satisfied anyway. Um, however, if you say, I'm just going to keep throwing it until I get a basket, that is not a fixed number of trials. It will depend on when you get it in. In fact, that's more of a geometric distribution. Okay, second one. There needs to be two possible outcomes, success and failure. That's kind of written into the binomial distribution. So I see this one as, you know, it's, yeah, it's there, but I wouldn't quote it, okay? It's kind of like, you know, imperative. You, you would, um, it's less important than the other two that I'm about to say. Okay, the next one. There needs to be a fixed probability of success. So it needs to be the same every time, essentially. Um, like if you're rolling a, a dice, it's going to be one over six. The second time, it's going to be one over six. Whereas if you're looking maybe at scoring a penalty in football or something, then you um, you might have like an average over time, but maybe you, maybe you like go through a period where you're not, scoring them or something or actually the classic one I think about is if you're maybe getting um, a toy out of a cereal packet they used to have that in in my day anyway where you'd like you know you buy some shreddies and you might get a little plastic figure at the bottom and then you try and collect them all but do you have a fixed probability of success or is it just like over time 30% or so have them into it it might it might not be fixed um, I always find this one the most difficult to explain, if I'm honest. And then the third one is the trials are independent of one another. So again, back to basketball, maybe you go on a bit of a hot streak and you're like getting them in because you find your range. Maybe you're more likely to get it in and then oh, right at the start, perhaps, where you're not getting your range, you might, you might not be uh, as likely to get them in. Um, so also maybe counters in a... Okay, counters in a bag, getting green or not getting green. If you are not replacing them, then the trials become dependent on the previous one. If you just keep picking green ones, the probability of a green one is going to go down. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. These three are absolutely vital, so vital that I'm going to highlight them right now. Okay, we need a fixed number of trials. We need a fixed probability. And we need the trials to be independent of one another. One more little example. So a tennis player might win 75 out of 100 matches in a season, given an estimated probability of success is 75%. However, can we assume their subsequent number of wins follows the binomial distribution? Well, we can give it a go. We can use it as a model. They can either win or lose. So a fix, uh, sorry, so two possible outcomes. There's going to be a fixed number of trials if we say, like, what's going to happen in the next 10 games. But how do we know that the other two are satisfied? And, that, you know, this is debatable, I think. So a fixed probability of success, well, it might depend on who they're playing. You know, whether they're playing in a, in a high-ranking tournament or a low-ranking tournament, it's not going to be the same probability. And independent, maybe, again, the games are going to get harder the further on they get in the tournaments or maybe it's going to depend on their form and injuries and so on. So I suppose I just want you to you know, 
th that's another two ways of explaining this one here. Okay, here goes. So I want you to state whether the following can model be modelled by a binomial distribution. Is the binomial distribution an acceptable model? If it is, then I want you to define the random variable and state the parameters, i.e. n and p, and one assumption you'd be making, i.e. the random variable for this would be x is the number of wins in the next 10 matches. So n would be 10, the number of trials, p would be some sort of probability of success, but my x would be the number of, of wins that they make. Okay, this one here, is this binomial or not? Well, this is what I wrote for the answer. Okay, X is the number of full TCDs in the box. That's what we're interested in. And I think this can be modeled with a binomial distribution. 50 trials, a 3% or 0.03 chance of success of them being defective. And we would be finding the probability that X equals two. So we have to assume the independence and constant probability of getting a full TCD, that getting one will not affect the next one, i.e. that the boxes are packed randomly as they may not be independent if all CDs come from one machine that's faulty. So I'm giving context here. That is really important. You can't just say, yeah, there's a fixed probability of success. You need to try and link it to the actual problem. Okay, what about this next one about call centers? All right, I'm hoping you're pausing the video and having a think. Um, that's what I'm assuming here. So the probability of getting through is 0 0.5. Find the probability I'll have to make four or more attempts to get through. All right, actually, we don't have a fixed number of trials here. We just keep calling until we get through, basically. Okay, and we're interested in if it makes four or more attempts. So we fail on that first one. And that's actually a geometric distribution. So we're interested, we're actually interested in the number of trials it would take rather than looking at the number of successes from a fixed number of trials. How about the next one? A bag contains some red and green counters without replacing any counters, that should say. Peter, Harriet, and Sally all pick out a, a counter. What is going on here? Find the probability that one of the counters picked is green. Okay, I wonder what you think. So we've got a fixed number of trials, but it's not independence because if you get a green or you don't get a green, it's going to affect it on the, on the next attempt because they're not being replaced. So be careful about that. And then when I send an email to my friend, there's a probability of 0 0.05 that I'll get a reply. Note my friend maybe should be in a double... Um, speech marks. If I send my friend 12, 12 emails, what is the probability that I get at least one reply? Okay, so potentially this could be modelled as a binomial distribution where x is the number of replies that I receive. x follows a binomial distribution with 12 trials, 0 0.05 chance of success. And we'd be trying to find out the probability that x is greater or equal to 1. We're assuming independence and a constant probability of getting a reply. However, if we start sending loads of emails, then um, they might start feeling sorry for us, you know, so it might not be independent. Okay, so these are just different cases to make you think about whether a binomial, bin, binomial distribution is valid or not. Let's look at an example that combines what we did last lesson with this lesson. Have a go, pause the video and have a go at this question. So we're being asked about x, the number of members in the sample who are left-handed. What kind of model would it be? Well, guess what? The random variable can take two values, left-handed or right-handed. There are a fixed number of trials, 20, and a fixed probability of success, 0.15. So assuming each member in the sample is independent, and you know we, we have to assume that, we don't know for sure, then a suitable model is a binomial distribution. So note, note what we actually know is true or like we're told is true. And then we have to make this assumption about independence. Good practice, I'd say, is to, you know, to get a, like basically try and talk about all three, you know, just a good shout to try and justify it and make you think whether it's valid or not. Okay.
Then part B, using your model to calculate the probability that exactly seven are left-handed. For this, it's going to be the probability that x equals seven. And what I can do is I can just uh, get my calculator. You could go back to your old school factorial formula, but at this point we we know it. We know it. We're just gonna just gonna go for the calculator option. Okay, binomial PD variable x is equal to seven. There are ten trials. Wait, twenty trials. Probability probability of success is zero point one five. And we get 0 0.0160. That was part B, part one. Sorry, I didn't say that. Okay, then B, part two. Fewer than two are left handed. Now we know how to do this from last lesson. It would actually be the probability that x equals zero plus the probability that x equals 1, plus the probability that x equals 2. However, I've got to admit, last lesson I just wanted to focus on that binomial PD button, but there is another button on your calculator that maybe you've already spotted if you played around with it. If we go to distribution and you press the down arrow, there's actually a binomial CD button. And CD we need to maybe just make a bit of space to talk about this. CD stands for the cumulative distribution. I don't actually know what PD stands for other than like D stands for distribution, but I haven't actually figured out what that P stands for. So it tells us the running total. And actually, if you use your CD button, like I just said, and we use a variable of two, then this time it actually works it out for me. Okay, 0 0.405. So binomial CD with x equals two. That x equals two in the binomial CD means precisely this, is that all the values up to and including two. So we can now use this for this sort of question. All right, to add to that then, I want you to have a go at this question. Can you use the binomial CD button to effectively work these out? You don't want to be doing these like we did last lesson. Okay, because it's going to take a, a long time. All right, let's look at this. So the first one. Get that binomial CD back up. I'm going to go... I'm going to go with a variable function. Just going to take it easy. Okay, 7. It's up to and including 7. It's less than or equal to. That's important. 20. That didn't go right. Okay, 0.4, 0.416. How about this next one? The probability that x is less than 6. Well, we don't put 6 in because look, check it out, it's not an equal to 6. So we need to first write it as x is less than or equal to something. So it's less than 6, that means it can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. It's less than or equal to 5. Just be careful with these ones without the less than or equal to. But after that, um, it's just the same thing as before. Okay, done. 0.126. I'm giving my answers to three significant figures by default, or maybe three decimal places. Okay, last one. Probability that x is greater or equal to 15. Alrighty, hmm, we don't have a binomial opposite of CD button, 
but we can still use it. We can do use what we did last lesson. We actually talked about this sort of question last lesson. It's going to be the prob 1 minus the probability that x is less than 15, because those two together must add to give 1. So we can still do these greater or equal to 1s with the CD button. We just might need a couple of steps. Just like before, less than 15 is going to be less than or equal to 14. Okay, I've got this. I'm going to store it in my memory. Do one minus that. And there we go, a bit more standard form. 0 0.00161. Brilliant. So, so far we've looked at uh, the suitability of binomial models. And now we've introduced the binomial CD button. Okay, let's look at one more situation where we can use the binomial CD button. Have a think about this one. Alrighty, here we want the values. We don't want two because it's greater than two, but we're going to want three, four, all the way up to ten. Just take your time on this sort of question. Now, the probability that x is less than or equal to ten, we know how to get that. But I don't want to have 0, 1, and 2. So I'm going to need to subtract the probability that x is less than or equal to 2. And then we're there. So we can actually subtract cumulative, uh, the cumulative distribution to give us answers that, like this. OK, if I go back to binomial CD list, uh, I want 10 and 2. I tried it with 15 and 2, but that was too big if you're wondering why that was in there. I've got 20 and 0.35. Here we go. Brilliant. I'm going to store that in my calculator. Store A. Store B. Okay, I could, in the exam, I'd like show all my working here, but I got this. And there we go, 0 0.935. Nice. Right, there's just one more kind of question that I want us to have a look at, and that is questions like this, where you might be given some of the probability or the fact that it's less than it, and you have to work back and find out the value of k. So pause the video, see if you can do these three questions. All right. Let's not stress about this, it's not too bad, actually. So what we've got is a binomial distribution. We've been told what it is, and I can do a list. And then I'm interested in lots of values of k, and I want it to be less than 0 0.2. So let's just put a load in, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Five and six, that'll do. And then n is equal to 12, p is 0 0.3, and I get my CD calculations. So I can see that the probability that x is less than or equal to 0 is 0 0.0138. So that's satisfied, it is less than 0 0.2. The next one, x less than or equal to 1, is indeed less than 0 0.2. But if I do x is less than or equal to 2, suddenly it's too big. So the maximum value, the largest value of k, is going to be k equals 1. I think for this I really should show some working. So x less than or equal to 1 is equal to 0 0.085. The next one is 0 0.25 something or other. And that's enough for me to then say that k is equal to 1. That's the largest value of k such that probability x less than or equal to k is less than 0 0.2.
How about this next one? What if I don't have a less than or equal to there? Okay, just going to write this down. Well, earlier we looked at the idea. Oh, did I do that? It was it was quite. It was early, here. It, here it was. X less than six meant x less than or equal to five. So we minus one from the six, and then we put a less than or equal to in there. We can do exactly the same thing here. X is going to be less than or equal to k minus 1, the next one down. And then that is less than 0 0.5. So it's just this extra step in there because now we've turned it into the same as the first question, just we're solving for k minus 1. And we can see for 4, if k minus 1 is 0 0.49, we don't quite get there. I think we should write that down. The probability that x is less than or equal to 4 is 0 0.49 something or other. 5, it jumps to 0 0.72. So that means that k that four is the is the largest value. K minus one is equal to four, and actually k is equal to five because remember it was less than. Just be careful with with that sort of question. And then finally, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna delete all of that now just to make a bit of space for c. Sorry, this should have been this should be c. All right, what about if it's a greater than? question. Again, remember, we don't have that function in our calculator. What we can do, though, is do this 1 minus again. The probability that 1 minus x is less than k, because these two add up to 1. Ooh. It's going to take a bit more time on that. I'm basically saying x greater or equal to 3 plus the probability that x is less than 3 is equal to 1. But this will be true for any value. I've replaced it by k. k. K is some value now that we're trying to find. And then I've rearranged to make this the subject. And it's going to be 1 minus probability that x is less than k. So hopefully you're happy with that. And I'm going to have to make this the subject. Um, there's a couple ways I can do it. I'm going to go the root of, I'm just going to minus 1 from both sides. And then divide through by minus 1. So I need to flip the sign around. And this becomes 0 0.95. Oh, so this time I'm interested. I've turned it basically, I've turned it back into question B. Because then there's a few, there's a more, this is the most complicated one, okay? Let's, there's no doubt about it. It's going to be the probability that x is less than or equal to k minus 1. This is what we did in part B, is greater than 0 0.95. And now I've essentially turned it back into this part A1. And I've, I'm going to have to do my list again because I'm not, oh, actually, I am there. Oh, brilliant. So I can see that it's going to be, so I'm not going to write down all my working this time. Um, I'm interested in where it crosses over. Sorry, the smallest value of S. Got to be careful here. The smallest value of, why did I use? Sorry, I've, I've messed this question up. I wrote S here, and then I treated it as K. K. I'm sorry if that was confusing. I, I shouldn't have used K for every single question, so I changed it here, but I forgot to change it here. But I'm not, not redoing really this. This is a solid video. All right. So the smallest value of K such that, such that this is true. Aha, okay. 
So actually, we can see that if k minus 1 is equal to 5, it's not bigger than 0 0.95. Whereas if k minus 1 is 6, it is bigger than 0 0.95. So we can write down k minus 1 equals 6 and k equals 7. So you can be really careful what the question is saying. Is it the largest value? Is it the smallest value? In this case, it is the smallest value because k is equal to 8, 9, 10. They will also satisfy that condition. Whew, okay, like it. That is, that's, a, mm, that's probably the toughest kind of question you can get on binomial. We have looked at binomial within binomial. Yeah, I suppose that's up there. Um, and these, like, these small markers where they ask for context and why the model is valid, they can be quite tough as well. But I think this is up there as, as a tricky question, but maybe you're like, no, it's, it's fine.